Hello, I'm Shivam Ghosh from Stratasys Software, and today we're talking about how to use 3D printing for consumer product design. Every time I bring the subject up, people always ask me, how realistic can 3D prints get? Hey Shivam, how realistic does 3D printing get? Hey Shivam, how realistic can 3D printing parts get? Hey Shivam, how realistic can 3D printing parts get? And that's entirely the wrong question to ask. What you should be asking yourself is how can I use 3D printing to get more done in a week than I used to get done in a month? Because the goal isn't to make an exact 100% representation of what you're trying to create, but just something good enough for a decision maker to look at. So what are we working on today? Well, my wife's a bit of a gamer, so I stole her video game controller, and we're going to see if we were a small to medium-sized industrial design company if we could design the next generation of video game controller and get a prototype to our decision makers as fast as possible. Okay? We have a new idea, we want to beat the market, and we just want it in someone's hands as quickly as possible. So I'm in the Stratasys Boston Makerspace. Behind me are the Polyjet machines, which can print in multiple materials and multiple cars at the same time. Behind the camera are our FDM machines, which can print in strong thermoplastics, one at a time. For our first prototype, I'm going to use the FDM machines because their prints are about half the cost of these polyjet machines. And the first thing we're going to do is model something up to print. So here I am in SOLIDWORKS and what I've done, I spent about an hour in the software and I made a very very simple shape. You can see I've uh, just using rough edges and booleans and putting some buttons on there. Okay, until we get it all ready for printing. Now, I, s I could send that to the FDM machine right now, and you'll get something about like this. It feels very rough. Within just a few hours, I could tell this is not a working design. This is a bad design. So I jump back into SOLIDWORKS again, and we're going to try something different. This is a controller I made not using just the generic SOLIDWORKS features, but a special add-in called Power Surfacing. And what Power Surfacing lets you do is, is push and pull and make a nice smooth subdivisional shape at the very beginning. And then you can apply all your SOLIDWORKS features to it. So all the precise machine shapes, uh, you'll see me do a lot with this later. But I really wanted to give a shout out to Power Surfacing right now. The ugly design, I spent an hour in SOLIDWORKS doing booleans and fillets trying to get to feel right. The Power Surfacing design took me about five minutes to get the nice smooth shape. The beautiful thing about our FDM machines behind the camera, though, is that you don't print these two separately. If you have an idea in your head, you just print them all together. And by the end of our first day on this project, within six hours these prints finished, I could tell right away this print would not work, this print felt horrible, but the power surfacing print felt really nice. People who have read my previous tutorial about the curved cell phones will know that I didn't just stop here on my first FDM print. I printed examples that were 10% bigger, 10% smaller, with more curve, less curve, and I did what I call sizing studies. You're just trying to get the size of this part down right away. And you use all the cheap FDM material you can for that. So I didn't do it for this case because I kind of hit it out of the park the first time, but in a normal situation, on this tray, I would have put four or five different versions of this at slightly different sizes to see if I would get it right. And if you really fill up that tray, just print it overnight and in the morning the parts were waiting for you. So by the end of your first day or maybe the second morning, you should have a great idea what size and shape your part should be. That's the first level, the base level of realism is size and shape. Now we're going to move one level up into feel. Alright, now we're going to move from the FDM machines and their one material to the polyjet machines behind me. Polyjet machines have multiple heads so they can put down multiple materials on each layer. The materials can be different colors or different stiffnesses. We have a material called Agilus, which is Shore 30A, about as stiff as a mouse pad. We also have a material called Vero, which is Shore 85D, about as stiff as a PVC pipe. And by mixing Agilus and Vero together, you can dial in your stiffness 
anywhere between there. That's what I did for this model right here. In GrabCAD print, which is our print driver, I took the different bodies for the buttons and I said, those are Agilus. I took the outer body and said, that's Vero. And I printed it on this machine behind me. But you can't just print pure Agilus and have the buttons come out exactly like what you're trying to simulate. And this is true no matter what you're trying to do. Whether it's a rubber overmold or a leather texture, you have to dial it in a little bit more. So I wanted to know what was inside those buttons, so I bought a bunch of spare parts for a controller and took them apart. And you can see we've got hard plastic buttons over a one millimeter thin rubber membrane that gives us its spring. Now I could have modeled that one millimeter membrane in SOLIDWORKS and then printed it, but we're not going to. We've got a better idea. There's a trick we use in our medical 3D prints, which is instead of having solid Vero behind the Agilus, I'm going to leave some space, an air gap. And the slicer will fill that air gap in with support material, which is softer than our Agilus. It's like a matrix, a mesh. So by controlling how much air gap I leave and how thin I make the Agilus, I can dial these button stiffnesses in even more. So that's what I did with these tiny models. And these test models took almost no time, about one hour laid out flat. And I tested 16 different button combinations to see which one most simulated what we were going for. So I chose the right combination, and I got the model we were looking for. And I tested it right here with a couple of my coworkers. And it didn't feel exactly like what we were going for, but it felt close enough for them to say, yeah, I can see what you're going for. And at this level, that's all we want. Remember, we're trying to get a prototype into our decision maker's hands fast. So it doesn't have to be exactly the right stiffness, but close enough is fine. People who have read my previous cell phone tutorial will know that you don't have to do anything special to get the Agilus and the Vero to stick together. If you just have them face to face in your CAD package, they'll bond together during printing it's tighter than even if they were super glued. So just have them face to face. Again, that's what I did here. And now we've reached level two of realism. The model is the right size and shape and it feels pretty much like the prototype we're going for. Now we're gonna to go to level three, which is getting super accurate colors. But before we do, we're gonna talk about modular design, okay? which is a trick we learned from a local architecture customer. This customer had to print buildings in different colors for their clients and for the clients to choose what building they wanted. But instead of printing this big, bulky building over and over again, which would have taken hundreds of hours, they printed the core in white once, and then printed modular snap-on covers so they could switch out the colors however they wanted. Okay? Really efficient. So what that lets you do is have lots and lots of different colors that you can snap on like a Mr. Potato Head. My print behind me has finished. You can actually see in the monitor. And so let's see what it looks like for one of these covers to come off of a J750. So we're going to open the hood. Scupper off the part. Remove the extra material. Wash it off real quick. So now you can pop off the old cover and put on the new one. One thing people always ask when doing modular design is how much of a tolerance should I leave between the parts? So there's a simple rule for that. If you're using FDM prints, leave about one layer height of gap between the parts. I was printing about 10,000 of an inch on that machine and if you leave 10,000 of an inch it, smooth, it slides in pretty smoothly. Having no other better information, that's what I did on my Polyjet machine. I was printing at 27 microns on that machine. It's a lot more accurate. And so I left 27 microns between our parts and it fits, but they're kind of tight. So I might have to do a little sanding. So maybe next time I'll leave about two layer heights on the Polyjet, but that's how you figure out how to get a nice tight modular fit. 
Having tackled that, now we're ready to move on to level 3 of part realism, accurate colors. Alright, let's move on to color. If you want to match your prototype's color to what your intention is, there's only three things you need to know. When you go down to your local Kinko's or copy store and try to print something in full color, they use four inks, CMYK plus a white sheet of paper. The J750 has six heads, so what we're going to put in there is the same CMYK colors and a white, because there's no white sheet of paper when you're 3D printing. So CMYK and white are five heads, and maybe the six head people usually choose clear, something like that on there. Okay, so to match CMYK, you have to put CMYK inks in your printer. The second thing you need to know is color proofing. We have swatches that are easy to print out. This only took about 30 minutes to print out. This is me trying to match the color of a Pepsi can. And you can print out the swatch and then match your actual part to see what color you should have. So we have profiles in Photoshop to match it soft on the software side. And we have an automatic swatch generator that you can link to in my color proofing tutorial to match on the hard side. And finally, the J750 now supports Pantone colors, a, sl a limited set of Pantone colors. So in GrabCAD print, you can choose the exact Pantone you want and print out a sample, and you can see it'll come out looking pretty close. So there's definitely a gamut, and some things are inside our color gamut, and some things are outside. Things that are outside the color gamut are metallics, really shiny metals, really vivid uh, neon colors, fluorescent neon colors. But for everything inside the gamut, if you use your CMYK inks, you use your color proofing tools, and you use your Pantone tools, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to get pretty close to the colors you want. If you need any Pantone cubes to kind of see if it'll match your color, contact your local reseller. We can mail these out to you. But that's matching color. Oh, one more thing. The amazing thing about the J750, because it has six heads, means I could have printed all these facades on the same tray at the same day. Because I can mix and match the different color heads, I could have printed them all at once. So one big overnight print, and by day three or four of our project, we can match colors as well. So on day one, we matched size and shape. Day two, we matched feel with the Agilus. Day three and four, we're now matching colors. And now we're going to move on to the highest level of part realism, which is everything else. So people think that 3D printing can do everything, that it's the end of the model making process. But in reality, it's more like the middle. If you need parts more realistic than what you're getting off the tray, now we're leaving the realm of 3D printing and entering the realm of prop making. And you can decide how much time you want to spend here. For me, for everything that's clear that comes off my printer, you always sand it, give it a light sanding, and do some clear coat. It makes a big difference. If you have parts that you want out of gamut colors, so metallics, and fluorescent orange, it's okay to print a mask and get some spray paint and just print over your part. I've seen people get some really neat results that way. One of my favorite tricks is magnets. Use the magnets you buy at your local hardware store. The back covers here we're having trouble attaching to the main. So you can see I put a little hole in, there's a little magnet there, and now it snaps into place. You can also do some weight control. So you can see here I've got some pockets in my part. So I can glue pennies or lead in there to make the part heavier if I need to get a more realistic weight. In this case, my parts were too heavy, so I actually put the pockets in there to lighten them up. Okay, So you can get more realistic weight control that way. One thing we learned doing this specific project was that Agilus coming off the tray is a little tacky. It doesn't feel quite right. So if you want to make it feel more like leather or buttons, you're not going to believe this, but actually get some cornstarch and a brush and just put a light brushing of cornstarch on the parts and that'll smooth them out and make them less tacky. I didn't bring my cornstarch to my pantry today, but here's a picture of me doing it at my dinner table, uh, just so you know it's real. 
But that was a fun tip we learned this time. And finally, one of my favorite things to do is little LED lights. These are little $3 lights we bought off of Amazon. And if you print your controller with a little pocket inside it to put the light in, and you turn the light on, what you get is, oh yeah, look at that. How awesome is that? So I can honestly say, this is probably one of the coolest 3D prints I've ever done. It's the right size and shape, the buttons feel like buttons, the colors are awesome, and it's even got the right lights inside to make it look like it's working. It's, it was really a pretty fun project. But I want to stress that everything on this table, except for the uh, 4th of July one we printed later, everything on this table I printed in one week. And really, all the prints were done overnight. I spent my days getting the parts ready in software, and then the actual work was done overnight, and I had the parts in the morning. So within a week, I had a new idea for controller. I have the right size and shape, feel, color, and little extra touches that I can hand to a decision maker and say, look, this is what I want to do. And I'm not even a very good industrial designer, so there's no telling what you guys will be able to do. So that's how to use 3D printing for consumer product design. If you have any other questions, email me at shivam.gosh at strasses.com, and I'm really excited to see what you guys end up doing with this. All right, here we go one more time. Hey, Shivam. Hey, Shivam. Hey, Shivam. <laughs> I'm sorry, he made me laugh.